The Education of Oversoul 7 by Jane Roberts Read by Martin John Chapter 20 The Speaker's Dream Tribunal The Night of the Soul 7 and Lydia Oversoul 7 began to fall headlong into himself or his personalities or something yet he was losing himself at the same time being dispersed into what frantically he tried to recall cypress's last words but they eluded him he kept feeling the separate essences of lydia proteus maha and joseph they were gaining a soul and he was losing himself was that it? No, he thought. It couldn't be. I'm each of them, yet more, he told himself. I'm the portion that makes them what they are, not the product of what they are. Aren't I, Cyprus? he called. But there was no answer. Even his thoughts began to slide away in the most insidious fashion. He felt his consciousness break apart into specks of energy, yet he was aware of his being in each of them, even as they fell away from each other. Come back, come back, he cried to his multitudinous parts. For an instant there was just nothing, and even Seven's terror was lost. Then he was in the midst of an incredible silence. There was no reference point within it. He seemed to be everywhere equally, yet nowhere in particular. It was impossible for him to say, I'm here, or here I am, because here and I had become impossibly synonymous. He could almost say, there is no here and there is no I, except then who was thinking. And then even his thoughts ceased, or he thought, he was not aware of it. Instead he felt dragged down, drugged. Even the I who had been doing the thinking lost itself, until only nonverbal emotion remained. Seven fought against falling. He struggled against this great power that seemed to push him down into some indefinable blackness. Souls can't die, once from somewhere within him, the thought surfaced. He tried to anchor himself to it, but it fell away into meaninglessness. All the while he kept falling and fighting against it, and the harder he fought, the faster he seemed to fall, the further down he was dragged, and the weaker he became. Once again, he managed to cry for Cyprus. At least he heard his own mental call, and again there was no answer. Nothing seemed to exist but this terrifying descent into darkness. At the same time, he felt that Lydia was falling too, surrendering, and in a different way, Proteus and Maha and Joseph all together. Suddenly, in the background of his wavering awareness, he thought he heard someone call, Old man! Old man! And he felt that the words must have a significance, though at the time they were meaningless. He couldn't tell where they were coming from. For that matter, the concept of where quite eluded him. The word Cyprus seemed once to hang in his mental vision, and he knew only that Cyprus was someone he needed desperately to reach. And in that moment, he realized that someone else needed him. There was someone he had to help, and only by helping this other, someone, could he rouse himself. He was falling with someone, for someone, because of someone, who was also in great danger. The need of that other consciousness became his own was his own. He became it, looked out through its eyes, through the drug-filled eyes of Lydia. The eyes saw nothing but the blackness in which all objects were swallowed. 
Then the falling intensified. But Seven knew that he looked out through Lydia, that this was Lydia. He had a reference point, and he tried to collect himself about it and save them both. It was her fear of death and dying that had trapped him, that must have come upon her with great suddenness, or had he just become aware of it because she had. It was impossible to tell. Lydia, Lydia, he said her name over and over as calmly as he could, even while the darkness rushed past them both and engulfed them in a chasm of her panic. Lydia, it was no use, he realized. She didn't believe in life after death, or the soul, much less her own soul. He could never reach her that way now. Lydia, he said again. This time he mimicked Lawrence's voice perfectly. Their descent slowed. He caused an image of Lawrence to appear in the blackness. Somewhere in it he could feel Lydia's surprise, her hope, and a small pinpoint of light appeared. Now Seven felt stronger. He caused Lawrence's image to appear in her mind and said, Lydia, darling, don't be frightened. It's all right. Larry? Even mentally, she could hardly form words. You're having a terrible nightmare, he said. That's all. Concentrate on my voice and it will be all right. Larry? This time her lips moved. That's the name of a friend of hers who died, Lydia's daughter Anna said to the nurse, Miss Only. Lydia's terror released her enough so that one clear circle of consciousness formed. Relax, Seven said as Lawrence. Your own fear is causing the nightmare, and it stops me from helping you. But I'm dying, Lydia's words rang through her own awareness and fell crumbling into the room. No, no, you're not, Anna said. Don't say things like that. She knows, Miss Only said. Lydia heard. Frantically, Oversoul Seven tried to calm her. Where was the real Lawrence? Why wasn't he here? Seven tried to call him, but there was no answer. Where were Lydia's parents or her husband? Why was there no one to help her? But Seven had no time to wait for answers. Lydia's fear was mounting again, and she'd have a difficult time adjusting if she died believing that her consciousness was really annihilated. He still had to fight against her panic, but he gathered together all of his strength to capture her attention. He needed a suitable vehicle. Suddenly he knew what to do, if he could do it. Slowly, at first in miniature, he built up the image of the old camper trailer in her mind. She began to focus upon it. It roused her interest and curiosity. As it did, Seven built up the image, enlarged it, brought it into focus, and then projected it outward until it enclosed them. And he adopted the image of Lawrence. Lydia! What? She looked around, spun around. She was in the camper trailer, in the front seat. Lawrence was driving. Greenacre, the cat, was on her lap, and Mr. George was in his goldfish bowl on the wide shelf under the windshield. She closed her eyes deliberately, then opened them again. Everything was still there. The sun was bright through the green treetops by the side of the road, and the air was soft and warm. It was early fall. Her right arm rested on the open window, and the air moved the tiny hairs on her skin. Everything was very real. We don't have far to go, Lawrence said. She looked over at him. He looked great, like pictures she'd seen of the aging William Sorovran. Funny, philosophical, his dark mustache bristly, his eyes grave and amused all at once. The hair at the nape of the neck prickled. 
She felt an odd sense of foreboding, yet she felt more alive than she had in ages. Yet, Larry, I had the worst nightmare, she said. I dreamed that you died and I was dying, and that I ended up in an old people's home after all. She shivered. It was so real. Yet here we are, our trip uninterrupted, going on as if nothing happened. You were sleeping, snoring too. But I didn't want to disturb you, Lawrence said. If I'd realized you were having a nightmare, but maybe it was something you ate. Hmm, she said. But what a strangely lovely day. I mean, there's something positively unearthly about it. And you even seem different, more sure of yourself, maybe. Decisive or something, wiser. That's just my natural superiority, Lawrence said. I didn't know it showed. Honestly, she said, but she felt uneasy. Her gaze flew about. She turned and craned her neck to see the back of the camper. Inside his Lawrence image, Seven was nervous, too. The camper was a duplicate of the real one. He'd placed everything as carefully as possible, but indubitably he'd forgotten something. Nobody was perfect. The ruse had to hold until she was safely dead to protect her from that panic, and if she found just one item wrong or missing, it could make her question the entire episode. Not that it would, he thought hastily. He could always think up a good explanation. Still, he wished that she'd stop looking around like that. Why don't you read me a few of your poems and practice for your reading, he asked. We'll be there soon. I left my notebook in back. No, it's behind me, Lawrence said. He reached around the seat and brought out the freshly materialized book. She was smiling. Oversoul Seven was so relieved that the Lawrence image was grinning from ear to ear. Seven felt much more like himself now, and far ahead, somewhere, it seemed to him that he heard Maha calling. Lydia laughed and pulled her visor cap further on her head to shield her eyes from the sun. This is one of my children's poems. It came so easily that I can hardly lay claim to it, really. And she read, The future rises up like a camel's hump, a part of the beast, like his ears or his feet, who rides the present, wise man or dunce, rides future and past, ah, all at once. A great little poem, Lawrence said, and true, too. Is it? Yes, I suppose it is, she said. I did a series of children's poems and called them Sumari Songs for Children. I don't even know why I called them that. The title just came to me. I always considered them odd in some crazy fashion. The book sold amazingly well, too. My own kids were young when I wrote them. Funny, as I said that, I had the feeling that Anna was upset. Now, I mean, I heard her voice way back in my mind. I'm sure she's all right, Lawrence said. Hmm, I suppose, she looked out. Strange that there isn't much traffic. We seem to have the road to ourselves. She's sinking. Miss Only said to Anna. She had minutes left. Lawrence said, We're coming to a tunnel. There's a terrific place on the other side that I want to show you. Oh? Seven materialized the tunnel quickly because Lydia's physical senses would be experiencing their final darkening. She shouldn't be aware of it now yet the final severing might possibly alert her to the physical situation and renew her panic. Oh, how dark it is, she cried, astonished. Tunnels are, Lawrence said. Mr. George won't even be able to see the sides of his fishbowl, she said. 
For some reason, this reminded Seven that he'd forgotten to materialize the second cat. Hastily, he did so, placing him in the rear of the camper. This place I mentioned, he said, I know the people will really appreciate you giving a poetry reading. They're poets, too, in their own way. Do keep talking. This tunnel makes me nervous. I guess I'll take off my sunglasses. We're coming out of it now. There's the light at the other end. See? Thank heaven. Poor Mr. George will think he's gone blind. Greenacre couldn't care less, of course. The cats can see in the dark. She broke off. Oh, Larry, how lovely. She's gone, Miss Only said to Anna, who started to cry and blow her nose and look for her Kleenex and sinus drops all at once. The landscape's changed. Look at that, Lydia cried, quite delighted. Inside Lawrence's image, Seven grinned. The landscape was an excellent job, he did say so himself. Soft hills, early twilight, but now he had to let it merge with the quite real environment, because he knew now where they were, and what he had to do. I might have to leave you for a minute after I introduce you to these people, Lawrence said. I'll be back shortly, though. It's in the nature of a surprise. A surprise? Yep. He stopped the camper, got out, dapper and chipper, and opened up the door for her. She stretched and turned around. Lawrence was gone. An old man stood beside her instead. He looked vaguely familiar, though she couldn't place him, and he wore a brown robe that suggested a monk's garb or an unconventional academic gown. Lawrence had to leave for a while. He'll be back. He turned you over to me, and I'm to take you to the poetry reading. I'm Oversoul Seven. What an odd name, she said. Well, if you're a friend of Lawrence's, I'm sure it's all right. After all, she thought, Larry knew an awful lot of far-out people. He used to travel around selling his leather goods off-season. She looked around. Is this a commune or something? Did you buy leather from Lawrence? I mean, do you know him well? I know you far better, Seven said, grinning. She was seeing him from a memory in her mind of an aging, sophisticated college professor, a roguish sort of would-be philosopher, but a kindly, well-meaning man to whom she'd once been attracted. Now what does that imply, she asked. I'm sure I don't know you, though you remind me of someone, at least I think you do. You'll remember, Seven said. But here is your audience. In a moment the poetry reading can begin. Lydia blinked. In the background there were groups of people, obviously waiting. Where had they come from? She hadn't been aware of them before. Nor did she know how it was that she suddenly was standing in front of them with the old man at her side. Politely, Seven materialized a chair for her, and she sat down. As she did so, her poetry book appeared in her lap. What was happening? First everything made perfect sense, and the next moment none of it made sense at all. She was about to say something when a lovely black girl in a long gown left the audience and came up to the platform. Lydia gave the peace sign, but the girl ignored her. Well, at least you're here, Maha cried to Seven. She saw him as her version of the old man, with a white beard, black skin, and clear piercing eyes. I don't know what's going on, but it's very important, she said, and I've had an awful time trying to find you. I fell into a terrible nightmare and kept falling and falling, and Sumter had to get me out of it. 
all that to reach you, she finished, accusingly. Sumter came forward and paused differentially. He bowed to Oversoul Seven, perceiving him as a giant-sized speaker of superior bearing, wearing the sacred purple robes. We're honored to have you here, he said. Honor yourselves as well, Seven said. Tell me, do you see me as an old man too? As a prophet, sacred speaker of old, Sumter said. Seven shrugged. I'm over soul seven, a learner and a wanderer. I'm not physical at all, but if you want to see me as an old man, that's your business. Now stop that. You are an old man, Maha said angrily, and the speakers want to know how I got here. You had something to do with it. That much is certain. My guess is that you know more than you're telling. Sumter frowned. Maha, this personality is one made of many. As our records say, be more courteous. She always talks to me that way, Seven said. They all looked so serious that suddenly he grinned and added, Well, I guess I'll leave now. You're all so profound that I feel out of place. But you can't, Lydia cried from the platform. Where's Lawrence? Seven sighed. You certainly all get yourselves in messes, he said. But suddenly he knew that the examination was nearly over. Memories that he'd purposely put aside now returned to his consciousness. There was a job to be done. Sometime you'll see me as I am, he said to Maha. But you'll have to see yourself as you are first. In the meantime, the necessary answers must come from you and Lydia. The whole must discover its parts, and the parts must discover their whole. Sumter stood back, smiling. Yes, I understand now why I see you as I do. My interpretation, of course. But you are who I knew you were. Am I? Seven asked. But there's someone I want to introduce. Please ask your people to be quiet and just observe. And Seven called Lydia. She looked down at herself with some surprise. She was wearing a lovely, softly folded gown that she remembered wearing years ago as a young woman. Confused, she said politely to Maha, How do you do? As soon as she spoke, the speakers stirred with sudden understanding. I've seen you someplace before, Maha said. But how can that be? She frowned. Maybe in my dreams. But I'm sure that I know you. They stood staring at each other, astonished by the warmth they felt. And then Lydia gasped. She was growing younger. There was no doubt about it. Something strange is happening to me, she said in a whisper. And besides that, the funniest things are coming into my mind. They're pictures of your life, she said to Maha. I know they are. They're your memories. They're certainly not mine. The same thing was happening to Maha. She saw Lydia as a child, as a mother, as... Quickly as Maha dropped her eyes, for the pictures in her mind showed her something else, Lydia's death and she understood in a flash that Lydia didn't know. A great, almost unbearable love went through her for this woman, this girl, this dead old woman. Confused completely, Maha turned to Seven. Lydia is going to read some of her poetry, he said. Oh, do, Maha cried quickly, for who would tell Lydia that she was dead? And what did the whole thing mean? How long could a dream last? If this was a dream. But suppose it wasn't. Sumter, she said. But Sumter took her hand and motioned her to be silent. The speakers quieted. Lydia opened her book. 
This is from my Somari songs for children, she said, and she began to read. The wind remembers tomorrow. Children hear its voice. It speaks through the voice of the singing leaf that dangles in time's corner. All at once is evermore. The leaf in the moment knows. It is present and past and tomorrow now. And even a leaf is wise. Sumter's face showed such utter surprise with the poem that Lydia broke off. What is it? she asked. The speakers murmured. Expectancy was on each face. Please read another poem, Sumter said. Maha couldn't believe what she was hearing. She just kept staring at Sumter, waiting for an explanation. Lydia looked around again. She was more confused than ever, but not at all frightened. Her poetry had never affected an audience so strongly, and she felt more exuberant each moment. Once more she began to read. No one comes to the land of time without wandering the fields of the hours, plucking the minutes that grow side by side, and climbing the trees of the months very high. Lydia got no further. Maha ran forward. She recited the following so quickly that the words all ran together. Dila ni bo, frasi iniga mam mambra, soju anda, si far bardi ninum, lar bitum tes mu, zi tu. Not yet. Don't say it yet, Sumter said urgently. Seven just stood there, feeling freer and freer, beginning to understand the events that would unfold. I don't understand, Lydia said appealingly to Maha. Do you write poetry for adults? Humpter asked. Why, yes, but I don't think I can remember any of them all the way through, and I don't seem to have that book. You can remember, Lydia. Seven said gently. She gasped again. His eyes seemed to unravel her memory. How odd. Yes, I do remember. Yes. And she recited Thought Bird Song. The birds outside my window are your thoughts sent to me from the nest of your brain. They come flying, fledglings. I feed them bread crumbs so they do not go hungry. Then they perch on the tree branch, with beaks open, singing. We have come from the nest of yesterday and tomorrow. God bless our journey. We have flown from the inside to the outside world of your knowledge. The cage door is wide open. We burst out, singing. We feel all the treetops, splendid and glowing, tiny as tree bells. We dance on the branches of night and days always. Listen to us. Feed us. We are your thoughts winging out of the nest of the birdcage into summer and winter. Our song is your heartbeat. We move with your pulses. You send us out, perfect and shining each living and different, to populate your kingdom. We sing outside your window and line up on the rooftops. As Lydia finished, all the speakers arose. They began talking excitedly together. Many rushed up to Sumter. He raised his arms for silence and everyone quieted as he began to speak. Lydia's poems as you now know, are translations somewhat distorted of the Sumari verses we teach our own children, in which truths, as we understand them, are passed on through the generations. Maha has been learning these precise verses as a part of her training. Sumter paused, then continued, I assume that our telepathic translation of the poems was correct but I was astonished that Maha understood it first. 
Then I remembered the connection between Lydia and Maha that was apparent when they met. But what is the connection? Maha asked. And what was the last longer poem? I didn't understand that one. The last verse was also from our Sumari records, Sumter said, but your training hasn't extended that far yet. Again, the poem is one of the many in which we transmit the truths of existence to the best of our ability. That's one of the reasons we're called speakers. We try to put inner Sumari knowledge into verbal terms for those who have a need for words. The word Sumari is Lydia's translation of another that refers to a particular family of consciousness. All of us here are Sumari, for example. But where did I get the poems then, Lydia cried. And who are all these people? I've never had such a dream in my life. I'm beginning to doubt it's a dream at all. But if it isn't, then what is it? She turned to Oversoul 7 and said impatiently, And where is Lawrence? You told me he'd be right back. And that was ages ago. Oh, I'm so nervous. I need a cigarette. Here, Seven said obligingly. He materialized a cigarette of her favorite brand from the folds of his robe and lit it for her. She puffed at it with great vigor and stared at him suspiciously. Now I'm not to do another thing or move an inch until you tell me where Larry is, she said. Seven sighed. Pretty soon he was going to have to tell Lydia that she was dead. End chapter 20. Peace, light, and love. Aloha.